Pallets are one of the most important things to understand in Dead by Daylight. As a consumable resource for the survivors and the main way to stay away from the killer, knowing how to properly deal with pallets as both killer and survivor is critical to how well you can do in a chase, to carry your team as survivor, or to keep constant map pressure as killer. In this guide, I'll be running you through everything about pallets, from the basics, to looping and conservation, to mind games. Let's start with the very basics. When a pallet isn't yet thrown, it's left standing up. The killer can't break it, and the survivor can use it to stun the killer by throwing it. Throwing the pallet stuns the killer, and the survivor can keep vaulting the pallet, while the killer cannot vault the pallet, though Legion can vault it to put you into deep wounds. Nurse can blink through it. And Hunters and Plague have projectiles that can go over the pallet. While it's down, the killer can break it, destroying that resource for the survivors for the entire rest of the game. Hillbilly and Leatherface can both use their chainsaws to break pallets as well. Every time a map generates, there is a minimum number of pallets that can spawn. The game will randomly place down pallets in places where pallets can spawn, though there won't always be a pallet in those places since it's random. As well, pallets can't spawn too close to each other, there's a certain range where pallets won't be next to each other. There are, however, places where a pallet will always spawn. The shack, for example, will always have a pallet in it. As well, both short wall and long wall jungle gyms will always spawn a pallet. Same for whatever the heck this tile here is called as a single pallet with no windows. The only of the four maze tiles that does not spawn a pallet is T walls. The pallet in the two jungle gyms will always be opposite of where the window is, and I'll go into more detail on this all later. There are plenty other places where a pallet will always spawn, like certain main areas of certain maps. Like this spot next to the basement on the game, for example, will always have two pallets. Since each map has a pallet minimum, so that many pallets must spawn, if you get some weird map generation that has like several T-walls on a cold one map or something, you can sometimes, rarely, find two pallets in one jungle gym, as the map filled it there so it could get up to the minimum if there was nowhere else to put it. There's two pallets here? Since when has there been two pallets here? I haven't seen a double pallet tile spawn in over a year! There's the basics, but how do you actually play them? One of the biggest mistakes most new survivors make is either pre-throwing or camping pallets. Pre-throwing means you throw the pallet quite a bit before the killer gets to the pallet, so tossing it knowing for sure you're not going to get to stun the killer with it, and lots of new survivors will go around chucking every pallet they reach in an effort to stay away from the killer, all while not looking behind them to see where the killer even is. The other mistake is camping pallets. This means that the survivor will just sit underneath a pallet waiting for the killer to get close by. Then they'll just drop the pallet to get the stun and move on to the next pallet to camp. This is a massive mistake for a few reasons. First reason is it diminishes the pallets way too quickly. Pallets are the main resource for the entire team for staying alive. So if you're going around camping every single one, you're just burning through your most important resource way too fast, completely screwing yourself and your team for later when you're getting chased and suddenly every pallet on that side of the map is gone. The second reason is that pallet camping survivors are incredibly easy targets for experienced killers. As a killer, if you see a survivor camping a pallet, don't just walk into the pallet or lunge through it. Start going around one of the sides instead. Try to start going in whichever alternate direction you choose early on. If you go straight at the pallet and then change directions, the survivor will probably toss the pallet thinking you're gonna come through it. Give that pallet a wide berth, make it look like you're going around another way. Be basically hugging the wall that the pallet is attached to, and instead of going the way that you want it to look like you're going, lunge back through the pallet in the original direction, almost always catching a pallet camping survivor off guard and getting a hit. This is more effective on tiles with walls that you can't see through or over, so the survivor has less notice that you're actually lunging the original way. Sometimes a survivor may also crouch on the other side of the pallet, hiding behind the pallet itself, which is again, an easy target for experienced killers. But what do you do against a pallet camping survivor when there is no alternate direction to fake, or the situation just feels like you shouldn't be doing this fake direction because they might run off or something? Like in this clip for example. The survivor went a decent bit past the pallet, making me think they were actually going to try to play it instead of camping it, so I didn't bother faking a direction and instead went straight on, only to realize what they were doing. So what to do? There are two types of swings, a lunge and a short swing, that happens when you hold and tap in one respectively. 
Usually, a lunge is the best option to go for, giving you a little extra distance and burst of speed, while the short swing gives you barely any distance and needs to be like right on top of the survivor for it to land. Against pallet camping survivors, do the short swing. The lunge takes too long and telegraphs to the survivor once the lunge starts that it's time for them to drop the pallet. The short swing is quick though, but you have to be pretty close for it to land. Due to its speed though, you can sometimes get in a cheeky hit before they can drop it. So, how should you actually be playing pallets? First of all, you should be looping them. Looping a pallet means that you run around one of the walls connected to the pallet, mirroring the movements of the killer to maintain as much distance between you and them as possible, while having a pallet to run through as you do these circles. Typically, you can get one or two loops around before having to drop the pallet, sometimes none if the killer is really close to you. Now, the idea of pallet looping isn't to escape the killer. Experienced players know that actually losing the killer in a chase is rare, and looping does nothing to help you escape. What it does is waste the killer's time. Looping pallets makes it so that it takes as long as possible to catch you as you can make it, maximizing the time your team has to work on generators, since when you get caught, people are going to have to leave the generators to save you. An extra 10 seconds spent looping a pallet instead of just outright throwing it drastically adds up if you loop every pallet, buying so much time for everybody to get the generators done. When you're pallet looping, you want to almost always loop around the longer wall. Plenty of pallets will have a short wall on one side of them and a long wall on the other side. Loop the long one. If you loop the short wall, you have to play perfectly around what the killer does to avoid getting hit, with the slightest of misplays punishing you. Typically, on pallet loops, the long side is the safe side, and the short side is the dangerous side. Don't take the risk, loop the long side. I said almost always earlier, because sometimes the killer will be getting closer and you don't have enough distance to actually loop the long side in extra time, but have enough distance to loop the short side once more before dropping the pallet. It's situational, the short side is still typically dangerous, do what feels right at the time. The safest option is to just toss the pallet when you can't loop the long side anymore. Some pallets will have pretty evenly sized walls on either side, in which case it doesn't really matter which side you loop, you can even switch between looping one side and the other. The most crucial part to practice with pal looping is looking behind you while you run. If the killer is chasing you and you're not near anything useful, looking behind you at all the time can be difficult since you'll probably run into something, so normally in a chase you want to briefly check behind you to see the location of the killer and then keep looking forward. On a pallet loop, however, you should know the boundaries of the wall you're running around, and can therefore be looking behind you all the time, since you don't have to worry about running into something. Sometimes really rarely a tree will spawn by one of these walls, but it's uncommon. If you see it, take it into account as you run around the loop. So when you're looping around something that has a solid wall you can't see through or over, you should always be looking straight behind you while the killer is chasing you around the loop. Unless of course they switch direction and you need to look in front of you to see if they're coming around that way. If the killer doubles back or tries other mind games, you want to wait on corner spots, taking advantage of the third person camera you have that the killer doesn't. By being on a corner with a third person camera, you can effectively have sight on both sides of the corner, maybe even both sides of the loop if you move around a little. Use this tool to determine which way the killer is actually going, and then mirror their movements. Alternatively, if you see the killer trying crazy mind games on the tile, you could always leave it and go to the next tile. The killer mind gaming the tile, assuming you're still there, might not notice you've moved on and you can make it to the next pallet before they realize. Only do this if the killer is trying crazier mind games on you, like a double fake or stuff like that, which I'll cover more later. Don't just leave because the killer switched direction once. This strategy of leaving is a bit risky no matter what though, as the pallet gives you safety, and leaving means you will get hit if the killer notices you leaving. If you're looping something you can see over or through, however, you should have your view on the killer at all times, always keeping the camera pointed directly at them. Now, pallet looping can take a bit of practice at first, with the part taking the most practice being identifying when you have to drop the pallet and when you have enough distance to get another loop. You'll get hit several times while practicing this, thinking you can get another loop when you can't, but as you practice, you start to get a better feel for when you're safe and when you have to drop it. Once the pallet is dropped, it can become either incredibly safe for the survivor to stay on, or incredibly dangerous, depending on the pallet. This is why it's important to be able to identify pallet safety. Pallet safety is essentially a measure of how good the pallet is, and how safe you are by using it. 
pallet safety is typically measured by how long the longest wall around the pallet is, meaning how big of a loop there is and how many loops you can do. Pallet safety may be reduced if the short wall is insanely short, or increased if there's a window near the pallet that can be taken as well. For example, this pallet on the chapel is very unsafe, only useful for hopefully stunning the killer by dropping it. It's the kind of pallet that's unsafe to the point that the killer probably doesn't even want to break it because it's an easy hit on survivors that may try to play it later in the game. These are weak pallets that you can only use to get the stun. Medium safety pallets are often spawning in junk around the map, with walls of about equal length on either side. Slightly misplaying your mirroring as you loop the pallet can result in you getting hit, and the killer can still get a hit after it's dropped, though it can take a while. Dang, she didn't fall for it. Um, let's try to bloodlust this pallet. Let's see how she plays it. I'm curious. And I can also get, like, a good bloodlust clip. Cool. What about strong pallets, though? This pallet that spawns on the paths is extremely safe. It might have a short wall on one side, but the other side is so long that it's great if you loop this side. This pallet can also sometimes have a bit of an exception to looping until you get the stun as you go, though. Sometimes you may want to throw this pallet a little bit early, known as pre-throwing it. Pre-throwing it by just a bit will make lots of killer players think they can catch you by not breaking it. After all, the other wall is so short. Nope. Killer has to start building up quite a bit of bloodlust before they can catch you, which I'll cover more later. But anyway, this pallet is incredibly safe. Then from there, there's god tier pallets, with the best example being shack pallet, as it's the most consistently spawning incredible pallet. When this pallet is thrown, it's literally impossible for any non-nurse killer to catch you here without breaking the pallet as long as you're not brain dead. The walls on either side are way too long. You can literally slow vault the pallet back and forth and never be caught, which is why this pallet is commonly called God Pallet among DVD players. This pallet is made even better by the window in Shack, which you can loop several times before having to drop the pallet. Because of the safety of this pallet, sometimes you may not even want to drop it to avoid getting hit, saving it for later to save somebody from actually getting downed, since it's one of the easiest bailout pallets. So pallet safety is usually determined by the length of the longest wall, so keep this in mind to determine which pallets are the best to use to stay safe, and the best to save for later. Let's talk a bit about pallets and how to play them. If the killer doesn't break the pallet and just keeps chasing around the thrown pallet, the killer will slowly gain bloodlust. Bloodlust is slowly gained by every killer during a chase, and becomes Bloodlust 1, 2, and 3 the longer the chase goes on. Every time the killer gains Bloodlust, they become slightly faster, making it easier to catch the survivor. There are three ways that Bloodlust can break. 1. The chase ends. It doesn't matter if the real chase actually ends, it just matters if the game thinks the chase ends, which happens if the killer loses sight of you for a certain period of time. For the game to recognize a chase, there has to be a survivor in the killer's field of view within a certain range, and the survivor has to be running. Either these conditions aren't met, and there isn't a chase. This is why survivors can slow vault the harvester back and forth to break chase. Check out the harvester guide if you're interested. So if the killer loses sight of you for too long, the game breaks the chase. You can tell it's broken as both survivor and killer when the chase music stops, and you can also tell a survivor when the game gives you escaped points. Once you get one of these indications that the chase is broken, you know that the killer just lost all the built-up bloodlust. 2. If the killer hits a survivor. Actually managing to hit a survivor, whether to injure or down them, will eliminate the killer's built-up bloodlust, resetting it. 3. Breaking a pallet. If the killer breaks a pallet, it removes bloodlust, resetting it. So, the longer the killer chases you, the faster they get, but this extra potential speed they get goes away every time chase is broken, they hit you, or they break a pallet. It's because of bloodlust that you typically shouldn't be trying to loop the same window too much, or play T-walls for too long. The killer will continue getting faster and faster, so you should be looking for a pallet to run to to break bloodlust. So, let's say there's a thrown pallet that the killer doesn't break, what do you do? Whether you should stay at the pallet depends on the pallet's safety. If it's an unsafe pallet, it's not even worth playing, since the killer will hit you anyway for the slightest misplay, and you should be leaving for the next safe area immediately. Are you gonna drop it? Ah, you dropped it, that one. Oh, you ran away! <laughs> I'm not playing Is that pallet. Palace? If it's a pallet like a junk pallet or one between rocks, you can play the thrown pallet, but try to be looking for the next place you can run for safety, since the killer will be building up bloodlust and getting faster. 
Now, this applies both for thrown and unthrown pallets, but more often for thrown pallets. The killer is trying to catch you by not breaking the pallet. Don't just stay on the pallet vaulting back and forth. You can make your way to the opposite side of the killer, forcing the killer to start looping you around the pallet again. As the killer player, you want to make it seem like you're committing into one direction before switching it up to meet the survivor on the other side. After this Meng Fin, I can pre-flick this if she plays it. Dang it. Experienced survivors won't always vault as the killer starts getting too close, as they know the killer will try to meet them on the other side. What you can do as survivor is fake vault the pallet, running up to the pallet to make it look like you're gonna vault, making the killer start going to the other side, and then just continuing your original direction. You can use the straddle windows as well. I'm not gonna make it to the L wall here though, I don't think. I'll try it anyway. Oh. And... I'm gonna fake this. <laughs> you fell for it. What, really? What now, or what is? What now? You make this window. <laughs> oh, it's the smarty pants over here. As killer, if you're playing against an experienced survivor, you can anticipate the fake. Make it look like you're gonna double back by changing directions for a split second, then going the original direction and getting a hit. Oh? Oh, hello! It's a me, a Mario! It's a me, a Mario! Oh, come on! I am so rusty at this game! Okay, maybe I'm not as rusty as I thought I was. Okay, so what I did there is I turned around to turn my red light that way to make it look like I was switching directions. So because he thought I was going around that way, he didn't take the window. And then I went the original way, and then I got him. When the killer doesn't break the pallet and just tries to hit you as is, this is called bloodlusting, as they continue to chase you without breaking the pallet to break bloodlust. So, the killer gets faster and faster until you eventually have to get caught. If you're doing this as killer, you hopefully haven't built up too much bloodlust, since that takes a while and means you've wasted way too much time on this tile that all the other survivors had the time to do gens. You should only be avoiding breaking the pallet if you feel like you can get a hit within 1-3 to three attempts of mind gaming the thrown pallet. One thing you can do is use a thrown pallet to judge survivor playstyles. If a pallet is thrown and you don't break it, you can try a couple of loops and mind games quickly on the survivor. If they work and get you a hit, then you should try that against that survivor again later when you have the chance. If it doesn't work, just break the pallet, and you know you should break most pallets immediately against that survivor since they know how to play well. So pallets like these are ones that are just barely safe. If the killer catches the slightest misplay, it results in a hit. Pallets with longer walls around them, like the car and crane in Auto Haven maps, is very safe. Very safe pallets like this are ones that you don't even have to loop the opposite side again if it's already thrown. You can just vault back and forth. In this example, the killer can still get a hit if they're playing against an impatient survivor who vaults the moment they see the red light. But with a little bit of patience, the survivor can stay right here for an extremely long time. In this clip, the pig player should have identified that their tactics weren't working, and should have just kicked the pallet rather than wasting so much time here. Again, identifying pallet safety is important. The pig should have identified that this was an extremely safe pallet, and should just kick it to get rid of it as soon as possible. Now, for the insanely safe pallets like Jungle Gyms and Shack, as killer, you should be breaking these ASAP. On a Jungle Gym, you could just not break it if you know the survivor is going to run to the next tile, leaving them out in the open. Only do this if you know they'll do this though. Most survivors will stay at the tile, considering killers can't catch experienced survivor players on these tiles, even at Bloodlust 3. The heck, man? Um, you are a freaking psycho, my dude. Also, how the heck did that not work? Are you really gonna get hit by me? I cannot believe what I'm witnessing. I'm not breaking the pallet of a long wall jungle gym and it's working against them. Look at this guy. I didn't break the pallet of a long wall jungle gym and I'm able to down him. What, what year is it? Now for one of the most important parts of pallets that honestly, I see less survivors keep in mind than do. Pallets exist to keep you from getting hit. So if you get hit anyway, don't friggin' throw the pallet. You've just wasted your consumable resource to keep you from getting hit. Just because? 
I call this panic throwing pallets, since rather than conserving their resources, survivors will just panic because the killer is too close to them and throw down the pallet. If you're getting hit anyway, the speed boost you get from that, plus the cooldown with the animation the killer does after getting a hit, is way more than enough to get away. If the pallet is thrown after getting hit, a lot of the time the killer will just go around it and get an easy down, then just break the pallet later. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Do you really think I can't see you there? I can use that in my pallet guide, maybe. I don't know. If the killer is running the perk enduring to reduce pallet stun time by 75%, then the time to get stunned by the pallet is literally shorter than the animation where the killer looks at their weapon after hitting somebody. Psycho. Enduring best perk in the game! Sorry, I got a little excited there. So not only do you waste a pallet, but you literally buff the killer by reducing the time before they can act. As well, if the killer has Spirit Fury, it hurts the survivors so much to be wasting pallets like this. Without Spirit Fury charged yet, it's a free charge for the killer. If Spirit Fury is charged, wasting a pallet after getting hit is the freest down for the killer as they just get to two-tap you for free. For example, in this clip here, the survivor would have easily been able to make distance on me if they hadn't panic thrown the pallet after they got hit. But because they did, I was easily able to down them because they just panicked and threw the pallet down because I was close. What are you doing? Well, she panicked through the pallet. Thank goodness for that. Um, how about you don't do that? Hey, what are you doing here? Nice dead hard. Well, you hate to see it, man. I guess you could make an argument to toss it if there's somebody fully recovered on the ground on the other side of the pallet or somebody hooked who's about to go to stage 2 or die and you want to delay the killer by like a second longer that you need, but if it's not one of those situations, you should never panic through a pallet. People do it because they're used to playing the game in a way where when the killer is close to you means you should toss the pallet, rather than you should conserve pallets for when you need it to save you from getting hit. As a killer player, knowing that a ton of survivors panic throw pallets, if we're running up to a pallet and I can get a hit, I purposefully wait until we get to the pallet to hit them. By doing this, the survivor still gets hit just like they would if I hadn't waited, but since they can pallet stun me, they'll often naturally do it and waste their limited resources in a way that does nothing but help me. As a killer, if you chase a survivor up to a pallet, don't just hit them immediately, get right in front of the pallet before hitting them to increase the chances of the survivor making the wrong play. A survivor, just don't panic throw pallets, learn to only use them to keep you from getting hit. So some stuff you can do with pallets. As survivor, if you're stopped at a pallet, it appears like you're camping the pallet to stun the killer when they get too close, which can bait the killer into either respecting the pallet, which is when a killer stops going forward toward the pallet to avoid the stun, or they'll swing through the pallet. <laughs> oh my god, you me. <laughs> Once they start getting close, if they respect the pallet or swing and you keep running, it will often buy you enough time to do one more loop, or make it to a nearby window depending on the area. <laughs> oh, are you fucking kidding me again? See, pallet. <laughs> This is a risky strat, however. If the killer doesn't lunge or respect the pallet, it's a free hit for them. Or if they lunge and your reaction time to instead continue running is too slow, you'll also get hit. Because this results in you getting hit if the killer just goes straight through the pallet, I would recommend only trying it if you feel like you know the killer will fall for it. How you determine this is by watching how the killer plays. If you loop one pallet, drop it when they get close, and they respect the pallet, then kick it before moving on to the next pallet you've reached, then you know this is a killer player who will respect pallets. In this clip example though, I just played messed up really hard. I dropped that pallet way before I should've. This was recorded like two years ago, way before I started streaming, and I wasn't as good at the game back then. The doctor player in this situation swung way too early. He was miles away, I did not have to drop that pallet. Despite the fact that I messed up so hard, I was able to identify this though. This player is very afraid of pallets considering how early he swung to avoid getting hit by that stun. So keeping this in mind, we go forward. I've now identified how he plays, so I know after looping it a few times that he'll respect the pallet. Hard. 
I fake pallet camp, and he literally presses the S key to stay away from the pallet. I keep looping. We get to the same situation and he falls for it again. At this point he realizes, I can't hit this survivor by respecting the pallet, I have to swing the next time they stand under the pallet. After you've punished the killer for respecting the pallet once, twice if you want to risk it for that hypothetical biscuit like in this clip, chances are they're not going to fall for it again on that pallet loop, and will swing next time. Typically what you want to do in this situation is to actually finally drop the pallet when the killer gets close enough. In this clip, however, I was paying attention to how much longer my sprint burst had to charge, and knew the next time I stood still for a brief moment, it would be up and ready. So I stand still at the pallet. The killer finally swings, not going to respect the pallet a third time. Sprint burst is now active and activates, giving me a burst of speed and avoiding the swing without even having to throw the pallet, making enough distance to get back to the first pallet in time since he didn't break it before, which I realized earlier so I knew I could run back here for safety. This is what pallet conservation is all about. Not exactly keeping track of the littlest things like when your sprint burst is going to go off to do crazy stuff like this, but using all the tools in your arsenal to the max of your own personal abilities to conserve the valuable resources that are pallets. Anyway, that's how you punish killers for respecting pallets after identifying their playstyles. As killer, you can actually keep this in mind to punish survivors. When I play killer, if I'm really tryharding, the first time I chase a new survivor, I will respect the first pallet throw. After all, they have to throw the pallet there anyway, because if they don't throw it and I don't respect it, they'll get hit for sure, and most killers don't respect pallets so why would they take the risk? If they're an experienced survivor, they'll make a mental note of that, I respect pallets. So at the next pallet, they can try to use that knowledge to punish me by fake pallet camping. Except, I don't respect the pallet a second time, I just go straight through, getting a free hit. This strategy essentially tricks the survivor into thinking that you'll play a way that you won't, making you unpredictable and lethal. There, pretend to respect the pallet and then get enough distance to hit him. Cool. Back to the doctor clip. I identified how he handles pallets at the pallet that I wasted way too early. So not only did I feel bad about wasting the pallet, but I felt confident that I knew what he would do at the next pallet if I pressured him into playing that way. If he had just swung through the first time I fake pallet camped, he probably would have hit me. As both killer and survivor, you want to identify the playstyle of your opponents while trying to remain unpredictable yourself to make you harder to read. Now, when you pallet loop, just looping the pallet itself is alright, but using windows to your advantage as well is incredible at conserving and getting the most out of every pallet. For example, in shack, you can vault the shack window until the entity blocks it before having to move on to a pallet if you play your cards right. Or on jungle gyms, you can often vault the window a couple of times before having to drop the pallet, making jungle gyms some of the safest and stronger killer time-wasting tiles that consistently spawn in the game. I'll have a separate guide on jungle gyms and other maze tiles, but in this guide, I'll cover the basics. First of all, my terminology might be a little different to what others may refer to them as, but this is what I use. These four tiles are all maze tiles. T-walls, the single pallet tile, short wall jungle gyms, and long wall jungle gyms, while I only call the latter two jungle gyms. Maze tiles are commonly spawning tiles and maps. The way maps generate is there's several tiles where there will be one of something in specific that spawns there. For example, one spot on a map could always spawn shack, and another spot could always spawn a maze tile. Each place where it can spawn a maze tile, it will randomly choose one of the four maze tiles to put down there. So map layouts in terms of what you actually get in the way of pallets and windows is a bit different every time. Let's talk about jungle gyms. A jungle gym will always have the same general look, and a pallet that can spawn either here or here, and a window that can spawn either here or here. There will always be one of each, unless the map RNG is crazy and gives you two pallets in order to meet the pallet minimum. So there will be one pallet and one window, and the places where a pallet or window didn't spawn will just be an opening to walk through. How do you know where this stuff is though? The pallet and window will always spawn across from each other. So if the pallet is on the left side, the window will be on the right wall, the long wall, making it a long wall jungle gym, while the wall next to the pallet has an opening. If the pallet is on the right side, the window will spawn at the top left, making it a short wall jungle gym, with the right wall having an opening. You can identify what type of jungle gym it is once you see either the pallet or window, since you can know the other is opposite to it. You could just loop the pallet itself, but the real strength of jungle gyms comes from using the window together with the pallet. 
What you want to do is take the window when you can, and do your loops both through the pallet and the window, until you have to drop the pallet. This window greatly increases the time in which the pallet will last you. For example, in this Huntress clip, I was able to get 50 seconds out of this one pallet on this jungle gym before it had to be thrown. That's over 1.5 generators worth of time if everybody else is working on their own generator at that time, all because of one single pallet that I used efficiently. I did slightly misplay in this clip, the killer could have gotten a hit if she played her cards right, but I managed to keep it going after a read. So in setups with a window next to a pallet, you can use the window to dramatically increase how long that single pallet lasts. It doesn't even have to be a jungle gym, and if you find a random junk pallet but it's right next to a T-Walls tile, that's a very strong setup in the right hands. Or say there's a junk pallet just outside the window of a long wall jungle gym, that makes for an extremely nasty setup in the right hands. If you get a map to spawn with a jungle gym right next to T-Walls, you have the potential to make that pallet last so incredibly long by using the T-Walls to loop through the pallet and the jungle gym windows. Get creative, just don't restrict yourself to pallet looping using only the pallet. Practice using the windows in conjunction with the pallets to maximize efficiency and save pallets for when you actually need to use them to avoid getting hit. Another thing you can identify as survivor is killer impatience. Sometimes a killer will swing on a loop a little too early, making them miss. If this happens, you can typically get another loop due to the cooldown of the missed swing. In this doctor clip, the doctor swings way too early, and I see this. Being a much more experienced survivor than I was in the last doctor clip I discussed, I know not to drop the pallet. Rather than doing another loop though, I identify there's a window in front of me, as we just discussed, so I run and vault that window instead, after which I mirror the doctor's choice of a side to go around and make my way back to the pallet again, increasing the time the pallet lasts. If the killer swings early, you can often get another loop, or make it to a nearby window if there is one. This clip is also a good example of improvising with a pallet and window. It's not like this setup has to be a T-Wall or jungle gym next to a pallet. In this clip, it was just a random Haddonfield window next to a random pallet, but I was able to use it to increase pallet efficiency. Identify windows near pallets and use them to maximize the time it takes to catch you. As killer, efficiency and keeping pressure on the map is everything. If you don't down and hook somebody, nobody has any reason to stop working on generators, making them get done fast so you want to catch survivors and chases as fast as you can. If you're chasing a very good survivor and they're in a very strong position for them, such as a jungle gym or pallet next to a window, it's important to know when you should be giving up the chase. If you go and find a target who's either worse at the game, or just a worse position where they don't have a super strong setup like that, it can be very advantageous for you. If you catch them, then there's a reason for people to get off generators and can force survivors away from the strong positions, allowing you to catch even the person you were struggling with earlier. If a survivor is at a very strong setup like a junk pallet right next to a long wall jungle gym and they know how to use it, even the best killer players will typically take a very long time to catch that survivor, time that all the others have to work on generators. So you have to identify the skill level of the survivors and the setups where you are. Sometimes you have to break the chase, find somebody else, and hopefully later finding the person you were chasing before in a worse position than when you gave up the chase. For example, in this doctor clip from earlier, I was running him around pretty well. He'd been chasing me for over a minute at this point, and by that time I'd only used a single pallet, and now I was running him around a pallet next to a window. He left me to find somebody else, not wanting to let every generator get done while he's busy chasing me, and by the end of the game, he actually wound up killing us all. Sometimes giving up a chase is the right thing to do. If you can't catch the survivor relatively quickly, and there's very few pallets being used during the chase, you should find somebody else. If you can't catch the survivor quickly, but it's because they're going around throwing every pallet, then you absolutely should chase them if it's early in the game, as it will destroy so many pallets other survivors will want to use later. So only give up chases if you're both struggling with catching the survivor, and there's almost no pallets being used. If the survivor's chucking every pallet, but there's only one or two gens left to do, you should probably leave them anyway, just for the sake of chasing somebody faster to get others off the gens. Also, if there is a survivor chucking every pallet, but there's only one or two generators left to do, you should probably leave them anyway, just for the sake of catching somebody faster to get others off the generators. If they're just throwing every pallet and there's three to five generators left though, it's probably worth chasing them. As for leaving chases when it takes a while to catch survivors, this doesn't even necessarily mean only having to leave chases against good survivors. Sometimes you should leave against brain dead ones too. If they're looping you around an infinite window, which means they can just take this over and over until the entity blocks it, then you shouldn't chase them there. Examples include the Ironworks of Misery window, 
a potential upstairs window on the Grim Pantry, or even the Coal Tower window. Windows like these are used by survivors to stay absolutely safe. Some survivors will take these windows just once and move on. And yeah, you should totally still chase them. They just used that window there because they had to. What if they play the game of Hub the Infinite Window until the entity blocks it to stay safe instead of being good at the game to stay safe? Then you should leave them. So many generators will get done by the time you have to catch them on horrible windows like these. There's an unfortunate amount of survivors who will exploit these kinds of loops as much as they can, and the best play is to just leave them while they're at this setup. So if the survivor is a very smart player next to pallets and windows together, or the survivor would rather hump infinite windows instead of playing the game for real, you should probably find somebody in a worse position. Shifting our focus back to the title of this video, pallets! Let's talk about zoning. After a pallet has been thrown, you shouldn't always just break the pallet immediately. If it's a pallet like Shack Pallet or other extremely safe pallets though, you should be breaking it immediately. It's way too far to go around after it's been thrown anyway. Pallets of about medium safety like Junk Pallets shouldn't always be broken immediately, because here's where zoning can come into play. Let's say that to the left of the survivor is a ton of stuff for the survivor's use. Plenty of active pallets, lots of windows, plenty of ways for the survivor to stay away from you. On the right, however, is nothing useful for the survivor to use. Maybe all the pallets have been thrown, or maybe it's the wall of the map. Just some orientation of things where this side is useless to the survivor, where the other side is strong. What you do as killer is start going in the direction you want to keep the survivor away from. They will have to mirror you on the loop if they don't want to get hit. You then make your way over to break the pallet, so now you've started breaking it while the survivor is on the bad side, increasing the distance they have to go to make it a safety, giving you the chance to get a hit. If the survivor doesn't mirror you on the loop when you try to zone them, well then easy down. Let's zone you. Oh. Never mind, I won't zone you, I'll just chainsaw down you instead. I was trying to get you to this side before I broke the pallet, but she's just gonna run into the middle of bumblefuck nowhere and get chainsaw down instead. I'll take it. I saw the blood trail going this way, so I thought she was there. As well, a lot of survivors will leave the pallet immediately after throwing it, assuming the killer will just break it immediately. If you start going around one side of the pallet with the intention to zone, but the survivor just leaves the tile since they thought you would kick the pallet, then just leave the pallet. You can kick it later. The survivor just zoned themselves without you doing anything, so just take the free hit, man. As survivor, patience is key. Don't immediately leave a pallet after it's thrown. You can move a little bit away from the pallet, but close enough that you get back to the pallet if the killer chooses not to break it. Once the killer actually starts breaking it, then you run. The suffocation pit has a very interesting pallet rock spawn. Once this pallet is thrown, don't break this as killer. Instead, make your way over to this rock. If you shove yourself into the bottom right part of this rock here, you can go up it. It's a pretty small hitbox to go up. You'll usually have to sit there working at it going back and forth to find the sweet spot for a few seconds before you get it. Once you go up the rock though, you can actually walk across the pallet, getting a free hit or down on the survivor trying to play the tile. After all, how can they make it to the pallet safely when you're literally standing on top of it? Are you kidding me, dude? What is that? that? What is that even? <laughs> it's Jesus, a, it's exclusive to Suffocation Pit. I haven't seen that rock spawn on other maps, but that's what you. Dude, I, I didn't even know that. Was, is that the is that the rock you were talking about? Yeah. On the pallet. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Bro, you just got in mind trick. Dude, <laughs> you can't even beat that mind game. That's yeah, you can. Not even it's not even a mind game. Once the pallet is thrown, if you stay there, you're screwed. It's like that little notch right there that you can go up. You can't do it with the left one. It has to, like, it doesn't work on the left one here. It has to be like this right notch you can go up. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. Like, oh, I, can, yeah. I can stand all the way over here and you can... <laughs> now, there is a couple more things I would like to touch on about pallets. One of the most useful, but also most situational aspects to pallets is pallet saves. When carrying a survivor, if the killer is stunned, whether by a flashlight, head-on, stepping in their own trap, or even getting pallet stunned, the killer will drop the person they're carrying. If a survivor goes down under a pallet and you're a nearby teammate, this can be a great opportunity for a pallet save. Saving a teammate with a pallet can be devastating to the killer's map pressure, especially if it took a long time to catch that survivor, giving an incredibly greater time to get generators done for the team. Once the killer starts picking up the survivor under a pallet, 
just stunning the killer with a pallet isn't enough to save your teammate. When locked in an animation, like the pickup animation, the killer is not able to get stunned, not from flashlights and not from pallets. They can still get blinded by flashlights, and the game still gives you killer stun points for dropping it on the killer while they pick up the survivor, but they won't let go of the survivor. The only way to get them to actually drop the survivor is if the killer has free movement, so they can start moving again. If you drop the pallet too early, it will just push the killer aside and they keep the survivor they caught. Drop it too late, and the killer will have been able to move out of the pallet by then. Drop it at just the right time, right as the pickup animation ends and the killer gets movement again, and you'll stun the killer, making them drop the survivor they're carrying while destroying map pressure and killer dreams at the same time. With practice of playing the game, you'll start to get a feel for how long the pickup time is. If, as a survivor, you know that you're about to go down, try to go down under a pallet if you can, giving your teammates a chance to pallet save you. If the killer slugs you, leaving you on the ground after downing you to briefly try to down somebody else, what you should be doing is crawling to the nearest pallet to start recovering, so if the killer comes back and picks you up, then an ally can have a chance to pallet save you. If you're left on the ground and it seems like the killer isn't coming back or won't be back for a while, may as well either crawl away or recover. But if the killer will likely be coming back soon, crawl under the nearest pallet. Pallet saves can also be more effective and survive with friends, as you can communicate to your teammates that you're under a pallet, or you're about to go down under a pallet. Especially if the killer leaves you for a moment, you can let your teammates know that you've crawled under a pallet, to position themselves to save you once the killer comes back and picks you up. You may as well crawl for a pallet when you can, because better safe than sorry, but the helpfulness and abilities of random survivors is sometimes questionable. Gives me an All right, idea. you're not even prepared for what's coming here. God damn it. God fucking damn it. <laughs> God fucking damn it. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, typical blend dead. I totally expected I know, right? I, I expected nothing, also, nothing more out of a blend dead. Pallet saves do, however, have some counterplay by killer. As killer, if you down somebody under a pallet, you might want to do this, but if you've left the survivor briefly and they've crawled under a pallet in this time, you especially want to do this. Search the area briefly, see if there's any sneaky survivors around eager to get a pallet save, and chase them off. If you find somebody, chances are they may have to loop the pallet that could save their teammate to save themselves. If they throw that pallet, then there's no way that survivor's getting pallet saved anymore. You can break the pallet and pick up the survivor. If you search the area and don't find anybody, but have a sneaking suspicion that there's a survivor around who you didn't manage to find, then you should fake pick up. When a survivor thinks that the killer is picking up the downed survivor, they have to run over ASAP or else they won't be able to get the pallet save, meaning they need to run up to you. Faking the pickup means you stand over the downed survivor for a couple seconds, making it seem like you're about to pick them up, making any potential survivors wanting to pallet save likely to come out of hiding and run up to you, thinking that they need to get there that instant to get the save in time, making them an easy target to chase. This in turn makes them likely to have to use the pallet to save themselves rather than their teammate. Let's say you're a survivor and the killer did one of these things to you, managing to find you when you wanted to get the pallet safe. The killer looped you around the tile a couple times and you had to drop the pallet to avoid getting hit, pushing the downed survivor onto the killer side of the pallet. Now there's nothing you can do to save that survivor since the pallet is thrown, right? Well, if you have a flashlight, you may still have a chance of saving your teammate. Right after the pallet stun wears off from the killer, the killer is right in front of the pallet and the down survivor is under the killer, the killer will usually try to break the pallet. The important thing to keep in mind here is the key bindings. The action to break the pallet in front of them and the action to pick up the survivor under them are both the spacebar. So if the killer presses the spacebar with the pallet in front of them, they'll break the pallet instead of picking up the survivor. If either one of these two options for the spacebar was no longer available, then the game would automatically choose the only available one. Keeping this knowledge in mind, the moment the pallet stun wears off, vault the pallet into the killer's face. The killer can't break the pallet while a survivor is vaulting it, blocking off that option, leaving the only option for the spacebar to pick up the survivor under them. Vault the pallet into the killer's face right after the stun wears off. They'll press spacebar the moment the stun wears off to try to break the pallet, 
but will wind up accidentally picking up the survivor instead, since you vaulting the pallet has blocked off the option for it to be broken. After you've vaulted into the killer's face, vault back to the original side. Now that the killer is in the middle of picking up the survivor, you can flashlight save them. This technique is known as CJ Tech. CJ Tech can be a bit risky. What if the killer is crazy and doesn't try to break the pallet immediately? They are just vaulting into the killer's face for nothing and they get a free hit on you for that. Most killers will likely try to break the pallet immediately, as it's the most logical option in most similar situations. Well, 12 pages of script, weeks of work, and this crazy length of a guide video later, that's about everything I've got on pallets. I mean, it's technically not everything I've got on pallets. I skipped unique play that you can do as and against each killer, considering this video is long enough as is, and I'll be doing killer specific guides where I cover how to play as and against them anyway. Not a 360, not a 360, fucking bullshit dude, shenanigans, shenanigans. Okay, E360 hooked me though. E360 picked me up and E360 hooked me, so I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay, wait, I, I, I gotta see what his name is. He always has good names. His name is... Finally sniped you, bitch. <laughs> uh... I actually did write out for this script how to play as and against every killer, but this video is long enough as a 12 page script, and it's a 20 page script with all the killer unique play and counterplay discussed too. As well, there is more depth on how to play pallets on specific tiles, like jungle gyms or shack, but for the sake of both our sanity, those will be covered in separate guides for those specific tiles, and the routes you should be running them. I only covered the basics in this guide. So technically it's not a complete, complete pallet guide, but covers everything about general play. For insight into proper play for more than just pallets, as well as some more info on how to play pallets as and against specific killers on specific tiles, be sure to check out my other guides. If you have any questions about any of this, stop by my Twitch. I'm always happy to answer Dead by Daylight related questions and explain what it is I'm doing as I play. Or you can join the Discord server and reach out to me directly. I hope I've been able to help you with this, frankly insane project of a guide video. Until next time, I'll see you in the fog. I'm a, I'm a play the pallet. All right. All right, go, go, go. All right, I'm gonna do one loop here, and then I'm a freaking drop the pallet just as is. Wow. I forgot. I, I, I was actually <laughs> playing the pallet legit, like straight up. <laughs> I was actually playing the pallet legit, like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try again. Let's try again. <laughs>